Thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate it. This is our fifth or sixth installment of our small press reading series that we do between Colgate and Syracuse. I'm really excited to have our readers with us today. I'll do, should I do all the bios at once? Or do bio by reading? Bio by reader. Oh, okay. yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> I'll introduce Adam Tedesco first. He's the founding editor of Reality Beach, a journal of new poetics. His recent work has appeared or is forthcoming in Moral Review, Grandma Weekly, Prelude, Pouch Powder Keg, Fanzine, Feds, and elsewhere. He's the author of several chapbooks, most recently Heart Sutra and Eb Ablaza. Ablaza. Oh, man, Ablaza. And most recently, the collection Mary Oliver from Lithic Press. Maybe I should stand over here so the caption is clear. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'll turn my microphone on. Okay. You should be able to hear me better now. Okay. Again, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a new collection of poetry, and it's called Mary Oliver. Just to give you a little background about what I'm going to be reading, uh, <clears throat> this book grew out of a process that began with this book uh, about maybe three years ago. I began writing this small book and I kind of, uh, for lack of a better way of explaining it, or for a couple hours to sit down and talk with you, I lost my mind in the process of writing this and I had to write this and get my mind back in order to finish this. So uh, to kind of recreate a little bit of the chronology there, I'm going to read to you poems that jump around a little bit between the two. Uh, and then there's some stuff in here, too, that I'm going to read that isn't in either one, but just because I like to be difficult. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to read off paper, too, just because uh, I sequence things this way and rather than take the time of flipping around between everything. <clears throat> this poem's called Apologia, and this is what begins Mary Oliver. Uh, I am headed toward you, and this is not uncertain. A soft watch, a melting watch. Watch for me so vanished of knowledge, of self. In the interest of self, seams of gray water glossed over cracks in the love object. A loop of crumbling. You dream of life drained into yourself. You dream of the reader on my insides. The expansive terms of ordinary crucifixion say, you can touch me and excuse us are me. The punishment of daylight, which has been intruded, intrudes upon me. And this is a poem, I, believe, this, I think this is a poem that was published by uh, one of our hosts here today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, uh, it appears in this book, in this rule, with no title, but it's, you know, I call it, I have no time of sense, and it begins as such. <clears throat> I had no time of sense, or not looking back for that Lux Eterna, the green flash as everything about today goes subjective against hot clay. The past is a mesa you can own, but what do you do once you own it? You can ride out to the shadow and stare upward, watching dust stream from its plateau, every moment of consciousness a weapon as it turns to pass. A town car wired to blow, a well-placed spike strip, a palmed stone. We can agree not to aim for each other. We can forget the natural state always dwindling. We can pretend not to know the gravity of open doors, passengers and carry-ons sucked into cloud. We can speak of the integrity of the impossible, surviving a megaton cruelty, the 
blasted man holds his own eyes in his hands. And how he knows these are his eyes. The past is an oak that owns itself. When the wind blows it down, an acorn falls and grows in its place. The child of the tree inherits the grounds, branches mirrored by roots, a quantum position of singularity, or safety in numbers, all packing heat. Um, so Mary Oliver contains a series of poems, um, each poem comprised of uh, four sonnets, to loosely define them. Uh, that's one of the, kind of serves as the backbone for the book. And I'm going to read for you the first of those that I wrote and that appear in the book, and it's called Pound Away. I stir dried fruit and seeds into yogurt and consider the flesh of persimmons. My second-hand knowledge of the sponge end of consciousness condensed into the meat of thought. Call it the I amness of suchhood, turned object, subject, symbol, word. The danger of absorption here in my cat as she surveys the comforter's hanging edge in her evening paraplum, the lone surviving member of her cadre. The Bader-Meinhof effect of a new threat to my houseplants, which we may call a way of life, is experienced when I apply the sound of waves and scent of eucalyptus to punctuate the evening shower, a whiting out of the natural world and its infinite justifications for avoiding risk, each crystal drop another motivation to forget. How it happens takes place after conversation when I feel the shift from contentment to butterflies on wallpaper hung upside down and a magnifying glass extending from my pocket like an oversimplification of Archimedes' death ray, only this time used for self-flagellation. Because yes, I am a fool. What I've left out here is his design called for an array of mirrors. What I've left out here is my inspection of self for any trace of manipulation takes place in the absence of mirrors, in the dark rooms of inventory and imagined self-perfection, where it is too easy to forget every conversation is a series of manipulations, the others pulling themselves toward the dream of common vision, of merged versions of landscape and time, the delusion of movement and knowledge of infinity. Imagine a version of me able to resist the urge to speak of Zeno now, an infinitesimal first or last instance of identity as I never want to stop recounting his arguments, as I want to believe that in parting we engage in illusion in rejoining the parting of veils. Imagine, instead, me telling you that I understand why Alexander cried upon hearing Anaxarchus describe an infinite number of worlds. For in how many could Alexander be Alexander, and this fear of the infinite lives in all men, should their power be lost in the possibility of another way? Then imagine the night's feast where Anaxarchus told Nicreon to pound away that you can pound on the pouch containing me, but you cannot pound on me. Remember how, as you finish your ride atop me, you are reminded of a word in a book, a clothed version of recollecting forever. I am recalling for you now how what we find we need in each other is what we remember in reverse. Once infinity leaves the room, there is a space equal to its size and shape, where we, through a series of regressions, return to nature, and one tree scaled trunk to another speaks of being climbed as the climber reclines, closing their eyes and recalling an arrow, the arcless story of its journey from bow to target, countless instances of weightless rest over a landscape we name longing. 
When the climber doesn't wake, when we detect no breath as condensate in the mirrored mouth, we drag the body out of the past and into the snow, what we burn and call it time. <clears throat> this is called What Could Happen. A family of horses inside a poem about a tree bent towards light is learning to rewrite what could happen, what the bomb undoes. A peacock feather sways near an open window. A hand rakes across brush bristles a deafening volume. I lose my ability to love unconditionally watching House Hunters International. Someone is painting a paddock full with horses. That someone imagines maggots dripping from the handler's hand into the clear coolness of the waters they bring us to. Someone learns that what we hate is this power we want all to ourselves, simpler now that we are less of what we were. The sun is a lion feeding us meat. I walk to you across its breath, confusing the sense of food and waste. In the tree shadow, I feed you the meat of your body, imagining a time when nothing's left. I stroke your mane, then change the dressing. Hit the lights. We are the atheists who met to talk in church. Something we were has been dead 28 days now. No one knows how big the universe is. It might be infinite beneath the whirlpool of oral sex. Consider the distance imposed, walking backwards there. A screen doors clanging somewhere in the city. I walk each street looking for its shadow. You're better at killing than thinking, maybe. That's a good thing, a common thing. This is uh, one of the poems that's not in either the book. It's called uh, Brighton Then. There's a museum stuck in my arm. Woke late for quail and tried pulling it. Squeezed out the ego and dried my back. I am a trench coat filled with children diving into the quarry. We want to take you for a ride in our plane. Crash into something expensive. A side of beef in Oyster Bay a house in the skirts. The sun's a hand-stitched saddle. You are my hands, made by no one at all. This poem's called Magnetar. I was a hard dancer before I broke my skin, only night and day beneath movement. Consolation delivered as the schooners cut through river wind. What about sweetness before and after the train of rising thought? Explaining my nose to your crown, I am what happens in forgetting common language. Body, a cooling island until its steam has left us. My name grows eyes and starch at the corners of a mouth. At sea, the moon is an engine of transference, each of you a wave. How many oranges will I burn, making an itch feel like an itch 
pricking the pin of false flags, mediating orchids and Glenn Gould's gloves. I am Brunswick Road, strewn shoulders with rabid raccoons. I know my body as the name of some small silence, a year within your charity, graving the night's talk and come, my own weight, the surface of a fresh line. Uh, now I'm gonna read, uh, I'll read two more poems, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is called The Soft Kibosh. They're calling muscular dogs fighters again. We comb the carpet for a geode of egg white smoke falling for a solid sense of dawn. The cheese of my face melts over the stove, curls in at the edge to become a parenthetical. I, how my tenderness brackets. I am the salamander and ambient cooling the s and of bodega roses multiplying two versions of my life. I crowd surf the history of light, a gaping scarecrow of spent cottons. And uh, I'm gonna end with the poem that ends Mary Oliver and it's called A Bureaucratic Desire for Revenge. We say we can see the matrix when the speed of novelty shifts faster or slower than our brain's ability to process change. Now that we can see that starting at the nostrils, we have a different musculature than ourselves throughout time, having both gained and lost the ability to process the scent of our own waste. This is not to say we are over rather over the need to discern a length of coiled rope from snake or poison from a geographic cure that has outlived itself in us. Chanting to yourself about love, you begin to feel it as you mow the endless fields, a sense of what made us us in the solid safety of cutting something back as close to the ground as the blade allows. Thanks. She's the author of five full-length books, including How Do I Net Thee from Salmon Poetry, The Son is a Blazing Hero from Lavender Ink, Dialogos, and Sissa Facina, forthcoming um, in 2020 from Pink. A graduate of Iowa Writers Workshop, she holds a PhD in creative writing and literature from the University of Utah. Shira teaches creative writing at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. inviting me and thank you all for coming here and I'm just going to adjust a few things everything is good the hearing and everything yes okay okay so um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read some poems from a few of my books and um, and so the first uh, book that I'm going to read from is uh, black seeds on a white dish and um, and this one is origami. It's very short. The back of our daily parts is raw hide. I don't like pub public spaces. Quarrels 
colors squirrel into the glass the shape of. Everyone lined up to get a seat on the mammoth bird. People flew on its wings, which were orange crushed velvet. They folded, unfolded, and refolded. And um, there are people in here who write poems, right? Okay, so sometimes you can just change the form of a poem, uh, do things to it, and you can start seeing different things in it and, and work with it that way if you're in a rut. So uh, there's a poem that I tried something, and actually in this experiment, the original and what, and what I tried together were, ended up working together. Um, so this poem is titled Celerity with a C, Celerity. After a pot of smoked tea, I drink trees. Green there, orange here, yellow. Leaves now triangles, then grapes. Round, fleshy pulses of color. Through butternut leaves, feet playing crackles like fingers on a flute. Themselves moonlike that bed on a lake's rim. Lake water, a newly minted penny. Pumpkin gold across everything. In a short time, it's bottom naked in a glass. 6 p.m. Thick, li thick light sucked up quickly, as if through a straw. Up quickly, as if through a straw. Bottom naked in a glass. 6 p.m. Thick light sucked <coughs> Pumpkin gold across everything. In a short time, it's lake's rim. Lake water, a newly minted penny. On a flute, themselves moonlike, that bed on a butternut leaves, feet playing crackles like fingers, grapes, round, fleshy pulses of color. Through orange here, yellow. Leaves now triangles, then after a pot of smoked tea, I drink trees, green there. And um, the, um, the last one I think that I'm going to read from here is the importance of being earnest. So I'm going to have to do some uh, Wow. Okay. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do I do some visual things that you'll see. Maybe, no, you won't see them. But uh, but I do some visual things on the page, and so I need to bring them to you with my with my hands or my body, however I do that. So the importance of being earnest. When verbs first rose to leave, it was for periods. I had no idea the matter was a part of speech when arms could be tables, the crest of a wave, gooey. To begin with, they didn't just fly off. No, they were a flutter of birds. Gradually, there was no distance between shades of periods and the stolid period itself. Their lapses spread to clauses picking entire sentences clean like leaves from trees. Dry looks hairy against a background of pink winter sky. Every vista brought on a question. Imagine being a kid in a playground in the sky between everything. I faded illegible as a fly wing. Why stayed in my gut indigestible? In the end, they couldn't escape gravity. They sank underground, pushing out spaces between letters, becoming infinitely obese, albeit printless. A letter like the sky seems to stop being a thing once it's no longer blue. 
This moment ghosted verbs are on an up escalator, circulating like carts on a ferris wheel. Perhaps on their way down, they'll clasp with their language. When I was little, I had cars with silver balls you placed in them to go. I compared the balls to energy, souls, feel, feel. I'm a fish with a beautiful apostrophe. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to this book, The Works and Skins, which is a narrative. Uh, it's a memoir um, that, that unfolds in poetry, prose, and visual elements. And I'm just going to read one from here. This is hand. He splayed his fingers apart, their movement, a Japanese pure, make a vacuum style, allowing them to twitch in all directions, implying cherry blossom petals dangling from boughs. He was a tall and fat man, his fingers incongruously refined, long, and sculptural. Of course the fingertips flipped up. I say, of course, because even at rest, he gave the impression that he covered everything, above and below. How the very signal of that gesture obfuscated, how the very signal of that gesture enveloped to the point of obfuscating my senses. This is why it is nearly impossible to communicate, to hand over the experience. He did it when he tried to make a point. But I tell you, whenever he did it, all I was aware of was the portrait he made with his hands. At their widest opening on their way down, they were bird wings flapping, and the hole between the wings, where there should have been a body, was me. So this book took me about uh, 10 years from beginning to write some poems. And eventually I decided that, um, that in order to articulate the experience that I wanted to articulate, it would have to be a book. And, um, and luckily I, I got a residency uh, at McDowell and I was able to finish the first draft there and then, then wrote uh, other drafts. Um, and, um, and so this is, this is a particular type of book um, so that when you read it, you have this experience, hopefully, I mean, you do have the experience of being like in a fun house. So, uh, so it's not, the, the events that happen in it uh, are, are, you find out in the beginning, and so it's not, it's not like a suspense thing of what happens, really, that makes you keep reading the book. Um, yeah. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go over to... Uh, to a longer poem, um, and uh, this one is called Black Flowers. Okay, so this one has some visual elements, it has some scribbles. And so in order to bring to you the scribbles, Okay, so this is a little longer, and this is a hybrid poem, so it sometimes veers off into more prosy, which I guess I, I read to you from hands as well. Okay, Black Flowers, one. My bubby, a black pomp marked with creases, an array of streets, now and then overlapping. Her name changed, rounded, to Mary. A stew of scribbles. Her pumps stretched wide open, excited, black flowers. Bubby, a middle of scribbles. Her pumps stretched wide name, a Jew new to America. It pumps, open stretched, flowers. My other grandma left the color, topaz, or a tea, soaking. 
I honor Bubby with a vigil on one of her last days. My other grandma, Esther, lived in a great shade after most of her family was killed. No one knows Bubby's birthday. A middle child split from two sisters. She left Lith Lithuania with her mother to join her father in the Bronx. Or she left with her mother and one sister who soon died from an intestinal infection. My mother gave my sister milk on a very hot day. She didn't know about refrigeration. My mother said, Bubby said. Before learning to read or write, she left school to work in a factory. Eventually, her father left. Her sisters killed by Nazis. Her mother diagnosed schizophrenic, dying in Creedmoor, though not before holding me, the baby. Bubby and her kids visited every week. She married Sam, a furrier, who left behind nothing except a tiny box of chiclets. He hid in a fist and let fall in my hand, and soft scraps of hide under and inside. Bubby's father eventually deserted, disinterested in everything except the rough in a big shadow after most of her family was days of her life. My other grandma lived slaughtered in the war. My other grandma left behind the color. A question mark, which is by its space to be slept, wafting. Two. Fish, the skeletal remainder of rooms, a very luminous, deserted sun inside of grandma's sorrow. Or was it my own loneliness? Nowhere to go, an open air market, unsheltered. A violin of inactivity. The same death of time took part in the apartment. Sunlight took up slats of the wooden floor with the wind through an open window. Light always soft outside as a raw paste. Morning, the heaviest fabric. She'd offer me food. I'd watch her peel apple skins, the fruit easier for her to eat. She drank tea with a sugar cube on her tongue and the flash of her gold tooth was part of her accent. Her things had been shipped from Vienna, a word like a shadow, Hay streets at dusk, no periphery. They came by boat to the Bronx. Furniture, china, tea sets, silver candlesticks, pisamen, and kiddish cups. Embroidery sewn by her dead youngest sister. After grandma died, my mother gave the furniture to Goodwill. Before grandma fled with her husband and two daughters, she ran a factory in Vienna. Here she tried to start a knitting factory, then ran a store. When Grandpa died early, he only left behind making scrambled eggs for himself in the back of the store. Yes, she had certain hopes and was critical. Shame over details about more details. Her father, Rebbe-like in Sambor. A sister I never met and a brother survived. Were she an open air market, unsheltered? She and my mother gossiped and argued mostly in Yiddish, so I couldn't understand. During the short periods they didn't argue, it was as if a red gingham cloth was spread around which I could play. She was cloying, dark, and claustrophobic. It was agreed. Silly what she read in Jewish news or heard at Hadassah meetings. Now a return visit to deaths. Where is it buried? The way from Vienna. Furniture, plates, blue-green mold. Three, a question mark as a breeze wafting by its room to be slept. Four, fish bones she buried. Furniture, place, but not the same time, dead, what way, where everything was the slats of time. 
My other PL as her sisters murdered by Nazis, her mother to her child, was if the way. My mother own, lone and kiddish cups. Yes, skeleton left behind, nothing hauled from her, left between mold. I try to join her time. A steeping in the past, so much history from her size, apple skins, the dead. What way from Vienna? Furniture, plates, cups, and a color. Topaz, or topaz, or tea, streets, the atmosphere. She lived in my hand. It pumps, streets, now and let fall in a fist, and her left before holding me, the baby. Bubby, a middle of streets, now and let fall in my hand. Okay, so I'm going to read one more that is a completely different tone and mood. And, uh, and so this is, this is a shaped poem. Uh, it's titled Pine Cone. Um, and this is in a different book, uh, How Do I Net The other one that I just read is in the Sun of Blazing Zero, which is my brand new book. Um, and this is, this is How Do I Not Be. Um, okay, so this is a shape poem. Has anybody written shape poems here? Um, so uh, so uh, I don't know if you can see, but it looks kind of looks like this. So it's in the shape of a pine cone, kind of. Pine cone. Something last in these mountains, pine out the window, woodhouse, sunlights. Outside, not that exciting right now. It's the inside that's crashing. Pack the trees, sky, pineapple smell. And what about the night black inlaid with more and more crystal? Lime cones and single bird calls, not one group as electric. Rumpa duda crackjack, the way the wind blows arm on ledge. Leaving this landscape soon, people hammock of imagination, swinging, let loose, want all over. But then what, after taking, giving, nectar, to end on dry rock? The rocks here are nice, smooth, and godlike. Piercing someone's individuality, what do you do with the straw? If there was such a thing as melon blue, this sky would be it. Thank you very much. author of Break the Bodies, Haunt the Bones, as well as Electricity and Other Dreams from New American Press. His writing has appeared in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, The New York Times, The Kenya Review, and elsewhere. Hicks grew up in rural southwest Arkansas and now lives in Orlando, where he teaches creative writing at the University of Central Florida. I'll try to be very careful with this. I don't make it spring at us. Um, all right, awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here on a, well, I guess this is a very nice day, um, at the end of the semester. <laughs> uh, when you probably have a lot of stuff to do, and thank you so much to Jesse for inviting me. I am just going to read very briefly from the beginning of my novel, Break the Bodies, Not the Bones. Um, I think the only sort of preface you need to know is that it is an incredibly um, weird, ridiculous book that has... Um, a lot of ghosts and aliens and robots and pig people and kids with powers and zombies at one point at the end and it's such a short just like smashed as many science fiction and fantasy tropes into one book as I possibly could and somehow I got away with it. Um, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll just begin. 
Swine Hill was full of the dead. Their ghosts were thickest near the abandoned downtown, where so many of the town's hopes had died generation by generation. They lingered in the places that mattered to them, and people avoided those streets, locked those doors, stopped going in those rooms. But you might encounter a ghost unexpectedly. In the high school where Jane had graduated two years ago, curled into the hollow of a tree, hands out and pleading on the side of the road, they could hurt you. Worse, they could change you. The haunted downtown of Swine Hill had been slowly expanding for years, stretching its long fingers into empty neighborhoods, where grass fissured the roads and roofs collapsed into rooms of broken furniture and shattered glass. For the people who'd lived and died on those streets, it was anguish to see the vine-choked houses, to know their descendants had run away from all they worked for. Their spirits, most present in the stillness of night, raged in the empty places. Even if she was late for work, Jane knew to drive around those neighborhoods. It was easy to feel alone. There were more dead than living in Swine Hill. Jane's aunts and uncles had gone out of state after the collapse of the tire factory and the lumber mill. The town jealously cleaved to the pork processing plant that had chewed up its sons for generations, hoping that in the end it would be enough. Most people Jane's age had already gone, scraping up enough money to start over somewhere else. The only ones left were those so poor they couldn't make it out, or so haunted they couldn't see a world outside their ghosts, or just clinging to a past they couldn't bear to leave behind. But Jane wasn't alone. Her ghost flashed bright and quick through her mind. Her car's engine coughed as she turned the key, something sputtering under the hood like a laugh and finally grown to life. It accelerated slowly, heavy with the weight of spirits. The speedometer and gas gauge waved their orange arms erratically. <coughs> Her windshield wipers often turned on without warning, and sometimes her horn would scream out of nowhere. My brother had this car. I'm pretty sure that's where that comes from. Um, she was happy the CD player still worked at all, though sometimes a ghost would settle into the discs, craving the bright sound of music, and then the stereo would play only noise. Jane flipped open a case of burned CDs and put in one after another until she found one that played, throwing the dead ones onto a pile in her back seat. Music crashed out of the tinny speakers, sticky electronic pop, the lyrics full of secrets, gossip, drama. The cold weight of her ghost swelled inside her, thrilling in the sound. Though Jane didn't know the ghost girl's name, it had been a part of her ever since she was a child. It was nosy, listening in on other people's thoughts and telling Jane what they were thinking and feeling. If the ghosts didn't have anyone else to listen to, it would burrow deep into Jane's mind, unearthing her regrets and fears, and making her fixate on them for hours. If it felt unappreciated, it might lie to her, withhold what it knew, or tell her the most vicious things people thought about her. But Jane had learned to manage it over the years, using music to placate it. The ghost had been her first friend, and now that she was still in Swine Hill after her classmates and family had gone away, Jane wondered if the ghost would be her last friend, too. Something like fog rose as the sun slipped behind the trees. A chain of spirits so wispy and immaterial as to be little more than air, a mass of faces and trudging feet bleeding in and out of one another, drifted up the road to the Pig City meatpacking plant. These ghosts weren't dangerous. They had somewhere to go, a purpose still. The plant that had employed them all their lives was older than the town, the only reason that Swine Hill hadn't crumbled back into the earth. The ghosts were the unofficial night shift, still swirling through its rusted doors, crowding its blood-splattered hallways to do their phantom work. Jane plowed through them like snow, their distorted faces stretching over the windshield. She turned into the grocery store's cratered parking lot, the sodium lights casting deep shadows at the building's edges, the storefront murky yellow and cluttered with signs. Near the front of the store, the specter of a man slowly spun up from the asphalt and took on substance. He lay on the ground, holding his stomach and bleeding, a box of strawberries broken open on the ground beside him. Decades ago, a police officer shot him while he was leaving the store. The cop had been called about another customer, someone yelling at the cashiers. It was a mix-up, a mistake, but one that had happened and would happen again. The ghost looked at every person who entered or left the store, his face a mask of pain and surprise, and mouthed, why? Jane, her shoulders tense, tried not to look at him and jogged through the doors. All right, skipping ahead now to later on at the end of the night um, in the grocery store where Jane works. A few minutes until closing time, the manager turned off half the lights, leaving the store dim. Jane leaned back against her counter, palms behind her, staring at the clock. 
The door side open again. With no warning from her ghost, a giant ducked its head and squeezed through the doors. He wore denim coveralls, oversized black boots, and a blue pig city cap. But he wasn't a person. His swollen arms, thicker than Jane's waist, strained the fabric of his sleeves. Thick gray fur shot up from under his cuffs and up from around his collar. His hands, resting on the small bar of a grocery cart, had four thick fingers, their nails flinty black. He glanced at her with an inhuman face. The creature had the head of a pig. Tusks protruded slightly from the sides of his mouth. His eyes were small and sunken, snout wet. Tall, triangular ears stood up on either side of his head. His face was a puzzle of scars, like he'd been pieced together rather than born, the seams still showing. Jane squeezed the lip of her counter, waiting for the spirit to do what it would do. It was so solid, seemed so real. There would be no getting away from it. She hoped it hadn't come to haunt her. Her ghost rose in her, sensing her terror. What's wrong, Jane? It's only a man. The hulking pig man pushed his cart toward the meat department. It can't just be a man, Jane said. What does he want? Him, her ghost swirled thoughtfully. Nothing. He's thinking about work, thinking about pigs. He is a pig, Jane whispered, afraid the man would hear. Being as close as they were to the haunted downtown, Jane had seen plenty of strange things walk through the door. People so weighed down with ghosts that they could barely speak, bent double over their carts, flinching from sound or light. But a pig, a walking, grocery shopping, plant working pig, this was new. Jane walked down the aisle toward the meat section, letting her ghost get close enough to listen in on the pig man's thoughts. Is he angry? Is he here for a reason? He's just thinking about meat. Prices. Nothing at all. Jane could feel the spirit's irritation. There was nothing worse to her ghost than someone calm, in the moment, without a gnawing secret or worry. The pig might as well be a newborn, his flighty thoughts catching on the noise of his cart or the flicker of the lights above. His cart creaked closer and Jane went back to her register. Her manager waited, a key in his hand. He dropped it onto her counter and backed away, thinking of the pig, but thinking too of Jane's ghost, of any ghosts that might already be invisibly closing in. I need to go home, he said. You can lock up tonight. He fled the store, leaving Jane with whatever the pig man was. He thinks it's a ghost. He's afraid it came into the store just for him. Jane picked up her phone and pressed the intercom button, announcing that the store would close soon. She was pretty sure the pig man was the only one left. Here he comes, thinking about sausage, of all things. The pig man was easily twice the size of the biggest man Jane had ever seen. His shopping cart groaned with weight. In it, he'd stacked hams, tubes of hamburger meat, big cylinders of tenderloin, and plastic bins of pork chops. There was nothing in his cart but meat, most of it pork. He dumped it clumsily on the conveyor belt, and Jane started checking him out. The cheerful Pig City logo, a cartoon pig giving a thumbs up, passed again and again under her hands. <clears throat> Jane tried not to look at his snout or ears. He pressed against her counter, smelling strongly of metal and blood. She felt surrounded by him, his towering height, his shadow, his bellows breath. She rang up $600 worth of meat, <clears throat> then bagged groceries while he fumbled a wallet out of his pocket and carefully tweezed it open with brutish fingers. He handed her a Pig City Company charge card. The name on it read Walter Hogboss. She rang him up and handed the card back to him. Thank you, he said, his voice a snarl, a collection of grunts and wheezing squeals pinned with meat hooks and stretched into words. With that, the pig man pushed his cart to the door and went into the night. Jane locked the doors after him, thankful that he was gone. He may not have been a ghost, but he wasn't a man either. <clears throat> He seemed like a man to me, her ghost said. She wondered if the pig man had come out of the haunted downtown somehow. There had been odd visitants before. Last year, right at dusk, a crowd of ghosts had flooded into the store and rushed the bakery, their semi-translucent bodies bleeding in and out of one another. They stayed there all night, the manager putting up caution, wet floor signs, so the living would know to keep their distance. As close as they were to downtown, lots of strange things slipped into the store, most of them small, invisible. Sometimes Jane went down the aisles, touching everything, feeling for the special electricity of the dead. 
Any boxed dinners or pasta sauces or flour sacks that were possessed were thrown out with the expired goods. The stray dogs that ate from their dumpsters snapped at things no one could see. Jane locked up and walked across the parking lot, keeping an eye out for ghosts. She heard the creaking groan of a cart somewhere. She fumbled her keys out of her pocket, ready to unlock her car or defend herself. The pig man pushed his cart out from behind a pig city work truck, blocking her path. His basket-like hands rested on the thin rail of the cart handle. His gray fur looked white in the wash of the parking lot lights. He let go of the cart and took a step toward her. Jane felt her mind stop, her body freeze. Even her ghost retreated deep within, both wondering if they would be dragged into a black place, snuffed out between his big hands. Excuse me, the pig man said. Something is wrong with my truck. Her ghost leaned against her chest, listening. He's worried his meat will spoil. Jane took a breath. Okay, I can take a look at it for you. Jane walked toward the pig man's truck. He pushed his cart behind her, fretting about the meat. She didn't have to pop the hood to know what was wrong. The whole truck trembled with ghosts. They filled its engine, pinging about inside the cylinders. They floated through the gas lines and the tank. They curled in the tires and entwined their bodies with the electrical. She couldn't see them, but her ghost told her they were there, told her what they were feeling. A pig working at our plant. A pig wearing our uniform. A stranger taking what's ours. Send the pig back where it came from. Don't let it take what little we have left. Did you drive through downtown? Jane asked. The pig man pointed across the dark smear of the city center. I live on the other side. You have to go around, otherwise the ghosts mob you. You're lucky it's not worse than this. She was surprised the pig man hadn't ended up haunted himself. The ghosts must not have seen anything in him that reminded them of themselves. Can it be fixed? he asked. Let it sit here for the night. By morning, most of the ghosts should have moved on. Maybe your truck will start then. She doubted it, but there wasn't much else to do. The pig man thanked her and stood there with his cart. He sniffed the air. Her ghost read his thoughts, how he weighed pushing his cart straight through downtown against taking a longer way and risking the meat going bad. Jane sighed, already regretting what she was about to say. I can give you a ride home, if you want. She hoped this wouldn't be a mistake, that the pig man hadn't been planning to get her alone in the close space of a car. That would be very kind of you, he said. Thank you. I think it's always good for people to hear about like how you guys came to writing. Perhaps like how did you become poets? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I came to writing. Uh, I mean, this happens to there. This is something that happens with some artists of, of having something. But it was because of the death. Um, uh, when I was a child, my brother died. He was two years younger than me. And for some reason, when I was, uh, uh, you know, it was my first experience of death. And uh, for some reason, when I, in, in my trying to be able to um, recover, whatever, um, I decided that I was going to try to be a writer. So that, that's the short, you know, there's, it's more involved than that, but, uh, but so I made this commitment to myself and I needed to, um, to uh, follow the commitment that I made to myself uh, because of, of its origin. So, um, so, um, so I actually wanted to write uh, fiction uh, because I felt like more people read fiction and uh, when I first started writing though, I started writing poetry you know, when I decided, okay, like when I was 12, I was like, okay, well, if I'm gonna be trying to be a writer, I have to start writing. And I started writing poetry, but then I wanted to write fiction, and I did write fiction for a while. Um, and, then, um, and then I had an experience that kind of like silenced me, and, uh, and I didn't write for 10 years, and, uh, and so that's kind of like the subject of this book. And when I started writing again, uh, I started writing poetry. 
And, um, and so I, I, I actually teach short story as well. And, uh, and actually this book wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't written fiction, because I, uh, I use fictional uh, strategies in here. Um, but, uh, but so, uh, so that's, and I also am a visual artist, and so I also uh, use that aspect in a lot of my writing. So I veer between poetry and prose and bring in visual elements. So, um, so I kind of, I kind of experiment with different uh, genres. <clears throat> you know, I've always uh, <clears throat> had an interest in poetry. I've been writing poetry, you know, since I was probably in middle school, you know. In middle school, I had read an interview with like a punk rock person uh, in a local like fanzine, uh, and he, this person, like recommended a couple books. Uh, one was uh, A Season in Hell by Rimbaud, and the other one was uh, Maldoror by Comte de la Tremont. And those books, like, were like the, my, those were like my entree into like real poetry. I mean, when I say real. I'm not saying a hierarchical sense, I'm just saying like besides Dr. Seuss and children's poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, you know, that was a pretty formative experience. And, uh, you know, probably you know, in all reality, also that was around the same time it fit, you know, the, the mind frame of somebody who was like going, undergoing a series of changes, you know. Uh, and it was something that I had always done, but I hadn't taken. I had always uh, other artistic outlets that I took more seriously. Um, for a long time, I you know made kind of like experimental electronic music, and uh, I've done some you know visual art as well. And uh, <clears throat> you know, funny thing about having kids uh, is uh, <laughs> it's you don't have, you no you no longer have the luxury of being able to sit down and work on something for like you know uh, a whole day, a whole afternoon at, for at a time. Uh, and so I was able to shift my focus into poetry, which allowed me to um, work on things for you know a couple hours at a time after the kids go to bed or before they get up, and still be able to express myself in uh, large enough chunks that I could uh, still formulate something you know cogent. You know, whereas uh, you know the processes I was using in other medium required just like longer periods, so it was like kind of just, an, you know, out of necessity that um, that came to be the main focus of my artistic expression. Yeah, I love that your origin story includes uh, reading a fanzine with a punk rock interview in middle school. That's amazing. I think in middle school I was like drinking my dad's cologne and fist fighting over pogs or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's it not that awesome and interesting. Um, yeah, my answer to this question is always pretty boring because I uh, I've never like I've, I've just always loved stories more than anything else, whether they were books or TV or anything. Like I feel like I can't help but like just want to make up stories and be immersed in stories all the time. Um, and so like as a kid I was writing a lot of stories. Um, and then did a very like traditional sort of like I think kind of boring like track through school of like getting a, a bachelor's degree in English and then a master's degree in creative writing and then a PhD in creative writing, um, and just feel very like lucky and, and fortunate that I've been able to, to publish and teach and do things like that. Um, but it's just been a lot of like me alone like at a keyboard like making up weird stories. Anybody else have any questions? We love to give answers, so if you have any questions. Do you have any answers? <laughs> That's a good poet question. Does anyone have any answers? <laughs> love that. Oh, question, not an answer. Um, <laughs> my question is, uh, how, like, when writing stories that take, you know, either months or years or whatever it is, how can you, how do you know when, when you're done writing? How do you know when you're, like, that's it, write it to the publisher? I feel like that's a good question for poetry books, too. Like, how do you guys know when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're 
You can answer first. Uh, yeah, I'm still thinking about it. Um, I think I'm a very plotty writer, and so everything has a pretty clear beginning and end. Like I set up something, and it's going to go until that thing is resolved. Um, and so, like I, I think for me, the question is like, when can I stop revising, or when is when is it as good as I can make it? And um, Usually I'm not the best judge of that, so I will make something as good as I possibly can and then I have to get readers to look at it for me and, and think about it, maybe get some distance and, and hear from them and see how that's kind of received. Um, and even then you don't know, like this book actually in a radically different version, um, my agent liked it and we even sent it out to publishers um, and like there was the possibility that it would sell and it ended up not. And I looked at it again after I looked at the editorial feedback and I thought, you know, I think I can write a better book than the one that I read. I don't think this is very good. I don't love it anymore. Um, so I threw it away and rewrote it. Um, but that's interesting because like at the time we were trying to sell it and even then it, it wasn't done, but I didn't know it wasn't done. Um, and so I think that's really hard, but other, other readers and other, I think the world does a pretty good job of telling you when the thing that you have made is not wanted. <laughs> so I tend to rely on that. Um, I, I would say that very very similar. Like I just I just revise until I feel that I, I actually there are times when I'm keeping on reviving and it still won't work and so then it doesn't it doesn't go out into the world and I keep I keep working on it. Um, but there are times when I'm like, okay, this is the best that I can get it and um, you know, it, it, it you know that it's not gonna be perfect. So it's just like how many imperfections can I tolerate in this, you know? And then, yeah, sending it out and seeing what happens and definitely having some readers, definitely need readers. Um, and, uh, and even after something is published, um, I can think that it needs to be, it needs to be revised mm -hmm. too. And, uh, and because there are times when I'll, even when I'm sending out a manuscript, uh, I will be revising the manuscript, um, and so then when it gets accepted, I have to decide which version I, I, I think is better, and that's always a big a big problem too. So it's actually a very big thing. Well, you know, looking at it this way versus that way, and which is better, and sometimes they're just different, and then you have to decide which way you want it to be. Finally. So, yeah, but I mean, I think for me, um, well, I think maybe one of the luxuries of poetry is in terms of you can, it's a, you don't have to. I mean, you certainly can. And Shears, some of Shears' work is an excellent example of doing something that has plotting to it. Uh, but you know, it's you have the luxury of being able to be a lot more like untethered uh, to any kind of arc. Uh, so, you know, in that regard, I think a lot of the way that I, you know, um, kind of, for lack of a better term, package my work or, like, figure out, like, when I'm done with a part of the work is just by feel, you know. Uh, you know, the first thing I ever published was a chapbook of poems called The Heart Sutra, and I it was really, uh, there's a line from a poem by Bernadette Mayer that I loved, fell in love with, and it was, my heart is a fancy place. And I took that idea and I just started writing, you know, this, you know, long poem where it just keeps repeating, like, these ideas of, like, what your heart is and, like, trying to kind of talk about, you know, some issues and that I was having and other things in that lens. And when that stopped speaking to me and I, I stopped writing about it, and, you know, there's the whole... Uh, editing factor and knowing when those are actually publishable and uh, you know and I think like workshop or like you know uh, you know having a group of writer friends that understand and know your voice and what you're trying to achieve is a very important thing in that respect um, you know, um, so that's very helpful and then you know ultimately it's the publishers who have the final say you know you know, I mean, we, I mean, with final creative control, you know, should be the writers, but I mean, it's like, as far as like, when I, a lot of times what will happen is, you know, I'll send things out, and if, uh, you know, it doesn't get picked up in any of the venues where I want it to be, I'm like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's not them, maybe it's me, so maybe if I tweak this, or maybe, you know, 
and that'll kind of like force my hand into some sort of revision until I get to a point where you know people are seeing the same thing in it that I am, you know. And uh, yeah, and that sometimes it doesn't end there. Sometimes if it gets you know published in a journal or a magazine, but then if it's later being collected into another body of work, it'll be published again to suit that, you know. Um, you know, and there's stuff of mine that was published, especially in the earlier stuff. That when I continue to read it, I'll, I would I make the the edits in my head as I'm doing as I'm reading it because I don't like the way it is, mm -hmm. exists on the page anymore. Uh, but as far as knowing when to stop the writing and discrete, it's just like as a poet, the, my luxury is I'm able to just go by feel and be like, okay, I'm done with that now. Either thing you read, or thing you watched, or album you listened to that sort of I don't know shook you and made you excited about making your own art, or just like you really liked. Like the most recent thing. Yeah, the last time something really grabbed you, and you were like, "Oh, making things! I need to go do that again." Thank you for reminding me art in the world. Well, actually, listening to your your ghost thing. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a Korean poet named Kim Hai Soon, uh, and I recently read a book of theirs called uh, well, two books of theirs. One's called A Drink of Red Mirror, and the other one's called Autobiography of Death. And uh, yeah, that was like tremendously compelling to like immediately go right. Also, I just saw that there's a translation of uh, Stephen Mahler May did a book, the book, and uh, and I got a uh, the translation of it. I got a copy of it, and it's like it has these graphic elements that are the kind of things that I like, and it's like really delicious to me. And I'm looking forward to reading it, and I it totally you know make, makes me race in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a whole like huge stack of stuff that I can't wait to get to once the semester is over. <laughs> um, but I think the most recent thing I read is I'm most of the way through N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy. Um, she's a uh, fantasy writer that won a Hugo three years in a row for every book of this trilogy, and she's the only person I think who's ever done that, uh, which is really incredible. And I'm just like loving the weird mix of like climate science sort of stuff meets fantasy. It's really, really, really fun um, and imaginative and new. And I'm, yeah, getting really excited about that. Thank you. So let's give them a hand one more time.